my name is Mark Danner. I'm a professor here at the Journalism School and a staff writer at The New Yorker. Um, and here tonight with John Arquilla to discuss um, our own worst enemy, seeking a better way to fight uh, the war on terror. Um, we were speaking uh, out in the courtyard a minute ago about the fact that the last couple of months uh, I've had the feeling, anyway, like I'm watching a bad movie played in reverse. Um, we've revisited subjects that we were talking about uh, uh, with great um, energy a year ago when John was last here, uh, before the war on Iraq uh, began. Um, and we're doing it again, as if it's all uh, revelation. Uh, the Clark uh, hearings, the general 9-11 hearings, uh, the various investigations underway, and of course, above all, the difficulties uh, that the United States military uh, is experiencing, experiencing in Iraq um, uh, in contradiction to what was expected, or at least what was predicted by our political leaders uh, before the war began, has led Americans to revisit these subjects. Um, in the background of all of it is the general notion of the war on terror. Uh, a war that now is about two and a half years old um, and that John has spoken about a couple of times before. Uh, as the primary season advances, we're in a strange predicament where uh, the president uh, and the Bush administration in general is ever more ardently uh, struggling to connect the war in Iraq to the general war on terror. That indeed this is a necessary war, uh, the war on Iraq had to be fought, uh, crucial, critical to protecting Americans and to keeping terrorists away from the United States, keeping terrorists from killing uh, Americans. On the other side, uh, many Americans uh, argued from the beginning, I was among them, as was John, uh, that the war in Iraq, in fact, was a distraction uh, from the broader war on terror, and that, uh, in fact, and John has been very prominent in arguing this, the war on terror itself was rather little understood. Um, I think you said the last time that fighting a war on terror is like fighting a war on air power? Yes. Is that what you said? Yeah. 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 Or if, as someone else said, it's like fighting a war against a noun. What exactly is it? Um, what does it consist of? And above all, how do we know that it's over? How do we know we're making progress in it? How do we know uh, when we have won or when we haven't won? Um, anyway, we, we've asked uh, John Arquilla back to discuss some of these subjects tonight. For those of you who haven't been here before, the idea behind these gold, uh, Goldman Salons is essentially to get, uh, get here to Berkeley, to the Graduate School of Journalism, speakers who we admire very much, interesting thinkers, to ask them to say some, a few words. We then have a dialogue, but the general uh, star of the show is meant to be you, the audience. It's supposed to give you a chance to, uh, to engage with John and bring up some of the issues that, uh, that concern you. Um, and I have a feeling that this subject being what it is, uh, that we'll have you know, a lively uh, discussion about it after, uh, after John speaks. Let me say a couple of words in background about John Arquilla. Uh, let's see, he earned his degrees in international relations from Rosary College in Stanford, um, where he got a PhD in 1991. He is now an uh, associate professor of defense analysis at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey. He's a specialist in terrorism and counter uh, insurgency. His teaching includes courses in the history of special operations, international political theory, the revolution in military affairs, and information age conflict. He has written many books, um, among them Lessons from the War with Saddam Hussein. The first one. The first one, Dubious Battles, uh, From Troy to Entebbe. That's a title I like, history of special I like a lot. <laughs> uh, Cyber War is Coming, The Advent of Net War, and the book, uh, my particular favorite, Networks and Net Wars, uh, which he wrote with David Ronfeld and which is about to come out in a second, uh, second edition. Um, so I'll ask John to, to um, um, speak, speak a while as he likes and then we'll, we'll talk between ourselves. But thank you very much for coming. Well, thank you. Thank you all for being here tonight, too. Uh, even if this is a salon, I need to get up and move around. So Help yourself. I'm going to Just don't take leave, this. Just don't leave the room. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's a long cord. Who knows where I'll end up. Boy, this is just like being in the Pentagon. I have a microphone that doesn't amplify my voice, but I must carry around with me. And uh, uh, no, it is, 
wonderful to be uh, with you here tonight. Every now and then I get to remind myself of who I really work for. Uh, the Navy signs my paychecks, but I work for all of you, and I feel that uh, whether the issue is this terror war we're in or any other matter in national security, uh, the best basis of uh, good policy is an informed public and a complete debate of the issues. And I was very pleased uh, amid that odd uh, presidential seance a week ago that the president, too, called for a vigorous debate uh, this year of all these issues. And, and I think I'd like to make his press conference, his speech and conference, a jumping off point uh, in our discussion tonight. Because in order to think about how to seek a better way to fight the war on terror, we have to have a sense of how we are conducting uh, this particular war, uh, and have been for the last two and a half plus years. And in this regard, the president actually was very revealing. I know there's been a lot of talk about how did he look, was he tough, was he confused, was he etc. cetera. Uh, I'm going to give you my take as a defense analyst about that, that conference. Was there anything revealing about our strategy? Yes. The president began by saying, can we win, or at, at began in, in the question and answer period at least, uh, addressing the issue of can we win by saying, sure we can win. Remember? He said, sure we can win because we can turn Iraq and other countries into democracies, and once we do all that, we won't have to worry about terrorism. Well, to me, that's exceptionally revealing that two and a half years on into this conflict, we are still thinking in a way that goes back to a previous era, in a way that suggests that our fundamental threats are other nations, not networks. That's why Ron Felt and I wrote that book about networks, saying there's a network style of warfare coming along. And we first started writing about this 10 years ago and identifying Al-Qaeda as the premier terror network uh, out there, which is, I guess, the reason I haven't been fired yet. So we sort of were thinking about those issues at, at the right, uh, at an early enough time. But uh, enough uh, self-puffery. Self uh, what's revealing about the comment, we are going to turn Iraq into a democracy and other countries into democracies, and our problems will be over. It suggests a focus on nation, not network. And all I would say about this is we want to talk about maybe pursuing a better way is on that one, we better be very careful lest we get what we wish for. If there were an actual American-style democracy in Iraq today, there would be a Shia government in that country. That's the majority in, in that country. It would probably be aligned with Iran or somebody else whose interests are inimical to our own. So we have to be very careful. But let's take that a little further in this strategy. How about Pakistan? What if we had a democracy there? We would have an Islamist government that would be rabidly anti-American and would possess nuclear weapons. And of course would be harboring bin Laden and his cohorts in the, in the tribal areas in Waziristan. Want a democracy there? Who's, who's lined up for that one? Uh, how about democracy in Saudi Arabia, which is so important to us for oil? You take my point, it's very hard to be consistent and thorough across the board with a strategy that says we win this war by democratizing others. Aside from the fact that it's very, very hard to democratize people at gunpoint, right? This is all about among the most secular, educated, and used to be wealthy people in the whole Muslim world, and well, now we've made war on them twice in, in the last 14 years. And it, it seems to me one of the terrible ironies of our time that we've ended up in protracted conflict with these particular people. So that would be number one part of the strat strategy is maybe we don't focus on the nation, but rather on the network. And I'll come back to what that means to go after a network. But let's go to another point from the press conference. There was a question there about what are we going to do with all these difficulties we've had? There's, you know, Kerry has the phrase, bring it on. Uh, what is Bush's phrase now? Stay the course, right? We will do whatever it takes. And the most revealing phrase in the whole press conference to me was when the president said, I know the Iraqi people don't like being occupied. I wouldn't like it either. Anybody remember that being said? Wow, that moment was just a like, like that. 
And what it said to me was we are admitting that we have lost the battle of the story in Iraq. What was our story going in? We're going to get these weapons of mass destruction. We're going to get the bad man out of, out of office. We did uh, get the bad man out. There don't appear to have been any of those weapons around. Come on in, join us. And uh, I think there's a seat somewhere. Here. You can even get a... There we go. Uh, what about this stay the course point? Well, the problem there is the more we stay, the more we end up doing things to protect our forces. And by the way, of our hundred and roughly 50,000 troops there right now, 90% of them are doing what's called force protection, protecting each other. And uh, very few of them are out on, on patrols because we're trying to avoid them being attacked and killed because that doesn't play very well back home. So we're spending most of our time protecting ourselves, but we are there, and this creates a story that doesn't make any sense to a great deal of the people in that country, the people in the Muslim world, and to the world at large. What is the story about Iraq right now? And I keep raising this point. When you're dealing with networks, you're really talking about people who are motivated by an idea. Al-Qaeda motivates enormous uh, emotion, and recruitment and support for its cause because it has a vision of reducing the shadow of American power on the world in a way that no one else in the world, no other great power or small power in the world is willing to try to do. And it galvanizes a generation of Muslims to sign up for that cause. That's a powerful story. Well, we've lost our way a little bit. A year ago when Baghdad fell, whatever you feel about the war, I didn't think it was a very wise thing to do. And I thought it unseemly that we would invade anyone who was dismantling his missiles even as our tanks were crossing the border. It was very, very odd. But that, that said, when Baghdad fell, we had very good polling data. Military takes polls too, not just American politicians wanting to get reelected. Good, solid, unbiased polling data that said that half the population of Iraq saw us as liberators. That's one year ago, roughly today. How about that? Not bad. Would anyone tell me what the figure is that sees us as liberators today? What percent? It's about that many who are willing to say it. Even a lot of the Kurds don't see us as liberators anymore, and they're almost 10% uh, of the population in the country. So we've lost a great deal of ground in that area, and as we talk about a better strategy in the war on terror, we have to get back to a good story. The whole world accepts the idea of ripping apart terror networks, cells in countries, 60 different countries around the world, planning to blow up trains, hijack planes, uh, spread radiological uh, uh, weapons, uh, detonate radiological weapons. Uh, there's something that everybody in the world opposes, and it's what Al-Qaeda has been doing. And that's a good story, that we are in fact fighting for a kind of civilization based on universal and liberal values. That's a good story to compete with Al-Qaeda against, and we need to get back on story. But again, that press conference suggested that, you know, the unfortunate thing, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat in this country, if you're a political leader, you can't say anything but stay the course. Because if you don't say that, you admit to a mistake of some sort, or that things didn't work out as well as they did. And I think this is strategically the thing that bothers me the most about us, how hard it is for us to be nimble, to adjust uh, to what's going on. Now, we've seen a little bit of adjustment in reaching out to the United Nations, which I think was a very, very good thing. Uh, but it's slow, and it's not at all clear what the authority of the UN will be in, in the current structure. Where I think we need to go is to talk about Iraq in terms of a UN protectorate. That gets the story back on, we need to restore Iraq to the family of nations, and our business is done here, and let's, let's move on and get back to the real business of chasing down Al-Qaeda. Which, by the way, is a very important part of the story. Something that doesn't get reported nearly enough. In fact, I haven't seen a story anywhere in the American press uh, on this about what really has been the price of going to Iraq. Okay, we say it, Richard Clark has said it, others have said it, I've said it. Now I'm going to tell you what the price was. There's a UN report that's not classified, it's also not publicly available just yet, but it points out that in the past year, an Afghanistan that was mostly under central government control has now had 14 of its 22 districts retaken 
by Taliban or Taliban-friendly warlords. So Afghanistan has unraveled a little bit. How about Al-Qaeda's operations in other parts of the world? Attacks in Morocco, Spain, in Tunisia, in Micronesia. There are attacks from Morocco to Micronesia that have been going on. Uzbekistan. I could give you a long list of names of countries and several attempted attacks um, in this country that uh, we have thankfully uh, thwarted. And, and that's, I mean, that's good news and credit where credit is due. We are getting a little better on this homeland security uh, uh, business. But the larger task of dealing with Al-Qaeda, it's very clear from this past year that we've allowed them to take the initiative while we created what we have called a central front in Iraq. Well, what if you created a central front and the enemy decided not to play? You know, what if he decided to go somewhere else and hit uh, soft targets all over the world? Uh, that's exactly what's, what's going on. And so it's another suggested point where we need to adjust our strategy. Uh, just one more thing from the, from the press conference that sort of gives a, a glimpse of what our strategy is and maybe allows me a chance to talk about doing things in a different way. The president was asked, well, well what are we going to do about the situation on the ground in Iraq? And here's the commander-in-chief of all American military forces says, well, the generals will tell me what they need. Now, there's some people of a generation here who know that you ask a general what he needs, and his response is, how much have you got? Right? You know, Vietnam went from some teams of special forces to, I need a half million troops and uh, another 100,000 in reserve in order to do what I need to do. A general never asks for less, always asks for more. And this, again, reinforces the point that we're thinking in terms of nations, of masses, of very classical kind of military strategy. And the president said, you know, I'll give them whatever they need. Whatever they say they need, they can have. An alternative strategy would be to think in terms of, well, maybe we need to make the connection between how many forces we have in this country and how alienated the population is. Maybe we need to connect the idea of how much military effort we make in one place and the effect it has on our ability to track, to detect, to track, and, track, and to disrupt uh, terror cells in other parts of the world. And the price of a big military footprint is heavy, not only in terms of the troops themselves. As you all know, most of our military is committed uh, to Iraq right now. We have scarcely one free brigade anywhere in the world because a division worth of troops has to be kept on the Korean Peninsula. And so we have uh, nothing that one would call a rotation base and uh, we're stretched absolutely to, to the limit. But if the generals ask for more, they can have more. So I'm going to suggest that maybe we need to think a little differently. And here is uh, a point, and it's, it's the last one I'll make before we go into our discussion, and the closest one to the sort of work I do every day and have uh, done for decades. And that is, uh, what we see here is not unusual in American history. We, from the very beginning, have had a tension between doing things unconventionally and conventionally. Going all the way back to the American Revolution, uh, there was a debate between George Washington and Light Horse Harry Lee about what kind of force we should build. And Washington wanted a continental army. He wanted something that looked like a European army that would fight stand-up battles with the British. Lee said, we're fighting a war for revolutionary purposes and must fight it in a revolutionary way. I have that on the wall in my office. I make all my officers look at that. And he lost that debate, and we, well, I guess here in the 21st century, we finally did create a Continental Army. Uh, the Washington's, it was not very successful. It lost most of its pitched battles, some were draws. Uh, we weren't going to win the war that way. But in the South, we had marvelous irregular guerrilla forces that drove the British absolutely to distraction and eventually forced Cornwallis to retreat to Yorktown, where he was finally trapped by the French Navy. And so we become a free country. Uh, fast forward, Civil War. Uh, you have West Point educated soldiers on both sides at a time when advances in firepower meant that you shouldn't be attacking mass to mass. Uh, they did it anyway. The South had incomparable irregular forces with Nathan Bedford Forrest and John Singleton Mosby, but just didn't use them. 
they, they set them off, okay, go, go do your thing, but they didn't integrate it into a strategy, and they ended up losing a war that they could have done far, I'm not saying they should have done better, but they could have done a lot better had they stood on the defensive and allowed the Union to suffer enormous casualties while their irregular forces raided all over a battle space as big as Western Europe. Uh, fast forward again to Vietnam. I know I shouldn't go too long because we want to have as much discussion as possible. Vietnam begins in the traditions of American irregular warfare, of Rogers Rangers and Francis Marion, with small teams working with indigenous peoples to identify the various Viet Cong cells, and, and we're doing quite well uh, with that. But a time came in 1965 when the Pentagon, McNamara, and others, read McNamara's in retrospect, it's very, very revealing on this point. And uh, the irony of it all is that the argument used against the Special Forces approach is that it would, quote, take too long, and uh, they could get things done better by transplanting our European army, which designed, in fact, to fight on the plains of Europe against the Soviet Union, to Southeast Asia, and somehow half a million of those troops were going to win the war. Of course, they didn't, and at enormous cost to ourselves and to all the Vietnamese and, and to our political standing in the world, uh, we suffered our greatest uh, defeat. What I'm suggesting is that we have deep traditions in irregular warfare, and there is a war, if you will, among the strategists in every conflict that we have, a tug to bring things back from the irregular to the conventional. In the fall of 2001, we toppled the Taliban with just 100 or so commandos on the ground, closely networked with attack aircraft above and unmanned aerial vehicles. Absolutely toppled them with a minimum of effort. But now we have 11,000 troops, and there are 11,000 NATO troops. Uh, there we have a core headquarters, we bomb, uh, we kick in doors, and the country is uh, basically, uh, well, basically Hamid Karzai is the mayor of Kabul now. Uh, so uh, we have conventionalized there. We took a very conventional approach to Iraq, which we're seeing, as, as I've said from last week's uh, press conference uh, that the president held, is very clear we're in that conventional route. And what it says to me is, again, we're regularizing a war, and this time, I think it could be even worse than Vietnam was a controllable loss, okay, a small area. Now if we don't deal with Al-Qaeda, we have two major problems. As a defense analyst, part of what I get paid for is to think about ways we could lose. Two things can happen. Uh, one is less likely, one is more likely. The less likely event is that a terror network gets its hands on a nuclear weapon. And there are lots of these. Uh, the public reported figure on the Soviet uh, Russian inventory, Soviet weapons, but Russian inventory, uh, is that 47 suitcase-sized nuclear weapons, um, four to six kilotons, are unaccounted for. When I say suitcase size, it would fit on this table, and a, one person can carry it. So what does that mean? Does that, that mean they're out on the market? I don't think so. Russians never throw anything away. They're, they're somewhere. Unaccounted means they had Arthur Anderson doing their accounting. I don't know. It's, uh, so, you know, we're working very hard. They have funded again. One of the things I talked about when I was here last year is we have to get funding back for the non-Luger law, which helps the Russians get a handle on their arsenal. And uh, we've done that. And so that's a good thing that's, that's happening. So it's a less likely event. But ask yourself this. If Al-Qaeda had two nuclear weapons, would we lose the war? Sure. They detonate one. And they say, we've got another one. How about if they just had one? What kind of coercive power would they have against us? Enormous, right? Because for all the thousands of warheads in the world that we had against the Russians during the Cold War, they keep anybody awake at night? No, because of mutual assured destruction. If the Russians nuke us, we nuke them back. What happens now, though, if a terror network that has no territory of its own strikes you? What do you retaliate against? I ask this to my students, and smoke comes out their ears. They, you know, they, there is no solution. So that's a very high consequence possibility. That's why I'm so worried about things that distract us from going after Al-Qaeda. The longer they're out there, the closer they get to a day where they obtain a weapon of mass destruction. And a small nuclear weapon is not the only possibility. The advances in biotechnology over the past decade have made it more and more accessible to have extremely serious uh, biological weapons capabilities. And uh, 
the ease of entry is uh, just getting greater and greater all the time. Anyway, that's, but that's the less likely high consequence way we could get hurt. The much more likely thing that's going to happen that I think events tell us has already happened is that bin Laden has become indeed the pioneer of a whole new way of war, of this network style or net war that Ron Felt and I talk about, and that it will metastasize and groups will be created that don't even need to know bin Laden. All they need to know is the general idea and the general organizational form. Bless you. There's a great part of the debate now is, was bin Laden in command of the cell that attacked in Spain? How about the one in Uzbekistan? How about the one in Morocco? How about the one in East Asia? If you're dealing with a network, the leader doesn't really matter. The idea matters, the narrative, the story that motivates people to sign up to the cause is what matters more than anything else. And frankly, a dead bin Laden is probably even a greater motivator for people to sign up. And most of the effort that we spend trying to go after him, I think is, is sort of wasted. What we need to do is to try to track these cells. The Europeans, over the past month, have been an absolute model of building their own network to fight a terror network. The cooperation between the Germans, the Spanish, the Moroccans uh, has just been uh, remarkable. And I hope you've been watching and, and listening to and hearing about these arrests that have, that have gone on. This is the kind of thing we need to be doing. And what I can tell you, there's a lot I can't talk about because then you'd all have to be taken into custody. Uh, but what I, what I can tell you is that there is this other war within the war that does go on. Even though almost all of our troops are committed to Iraq, small teams of special forces are redeploying to many different places around the world. And I can say that some are in Latin America and some in different parts of Africa, Asia, uh, basically all over the world. And there are small successes every day, working largely with others sometimes advising, sometimes taking direct action, sometimes an unmanned aerial vehicle blows something up. Uh, and that's the unreported war that uh, is, is going on. And it's one where a great deal of progress is made, but far greater resources need to be devoted to that approach uh, rather than to what's going on in Iraq. For, for me, it, it's all redolent uh, in Iraq of John Steinbeck's great uh, novel, uh, The Moon is Down. It's a novel about occupation and resistance. Uh, no country's named. Uh, there's a phrase at the end, the, uh, the occupiers have won a stunning military victory, but those occupied are determined to resist them nonetheless. And Dr. Winter, one of the characters in the book at the end, who's arrested and is going to, ah, oh, someone knows their Steinbeck. What does he say at the end before he's uh, going to be executed? Uh, he says, ah, the flies have conquered the flypaper. Uh, this is a problem. If you think and fight in a conventional way, you're going to tie yourself down very, very quickly. If there is, and trust me, what goes on in Iraq right now is an afternoon tea party compared to what will happen if the whole country rises up. There aren't enough troops in the whole American military, Marines, Army, all the services, to deal with a country that goes up in arms. What we have right now is a simple foreshadowing. And the good news, I think, is that we are reconsidering are trying to uh, bring the UN in more fully, and, and that has to be encouraged uh, very, very much. But uh, let me just uh, close on a point here. What's going to happen? This tug between fighting against these irregulars in an irregular way, of building our own network to fight a network, versus the classical, we're going to deal with this country by country by country, we're going to use as much force as generals ask for. How's that debate going to be resolved? I think you all will play a large role in that. We, the gods have given us an election year this time. And what that means is at a minimum, we may be able to prompt a thorough, fair, and open debate of these issues. And I'm confident if we do that, these retrograde ideas about fighting the last kind of war are going to fall of their own weight. I, I have to believe that uh, if I'm going to continue to do my job each day. Now, I think were weakened a little bit in that each of the candidates running for, major candidates running for president supported the war, want to stay the course. Uh, but I think even, even with that sort of conventional duopoly in, in play, uh, driving a general sort of American policy, a good debate can move mountains. 
And so I, I hope that's the kind of thing we have. I hope we can have some discussion tonight, but I hope also uh, we have a true and searching analysis of the issues in, uh, in the months ahead. It's, um, well, it's a little silly talking into a dead mic, but not too much. So I'm going to stop doing that now. Okay. Thank you, John. I'm going to begin by uh, uh, being George W. Bush for a minute. Um, <laughs> come on, you can do better than that. <laughs> it's a very disappointing reaction. Um, I, I think that you know when you talk about losing the battle of the story, uh, my impression uh, of what the president might say to that, and he said it, versions of it in public many times, uh, his reaction would be, look, what are you talking about? I mean, I went into Iraq to win the battle of the story. Uh, you know, you have these people uh, throughout the Islamic world who, see, who have no hope. They have no future. They see societies uh, that are deadlocked. They see political systems that are oppressive. They see rulers who are autocratic. What the United States has to do is not only respond to these people by trying to kill them wherever we can find them, but it has to in some way give them hope of a better future. And to do that, we're going to take the most autocratic, the most terrible, and the most threatening regime uh, of them all, which is Saddam Hussein's Iraq, and we're going to replace it with a representative government which can show that, in fact, there is a different way. So this is, uh, though it looks like a conventional military action, in fact, it is supremely a political action. It's, it's an effort to give the Islamic world a sense of political hope. And only in that political hope can we get out from under what could be a decades-long war uh, on terror. Uh, so I have taken this step, this bold step, this controversial step, uh, to end this threat by giving hope to the other side. Um, what would you say to that? Well, Mr. President, why didn't you uh, tell us this was your real motivation uh, before you went in? Uh, it seems to me that you said that we needed to root out these weapons of mass destruction, which we now know uh, didn't, didn't exist. And, and it seems to me that if this is indeed a strategy designed for the whole Muslim world to democratize one country after another, it is uh, highly irregular of us to uh, work closely with a military dictator in Pakistan and with authoritarian and quite corrupt rulers in Saudi Arabia, and indeed to work actively against the spread of democracy among most of our uh, Arab allies. Well, and, we have to go one place at a time. <laughs> and uh, well, are, are you saying that you, there will be others after, after Iraq? Absolutely. Uh, We've put together a democratic initiative in the Middle East. Uh, we're aiding democratic forces. This is just the beginning here, John. Yeah, uh, what, what I'm afraid I, I see, Mr. President, is that we're providing far more aid to those who are staunch enemies of democracy. And there are reasons of state why we would do that. Um, I, see, even if you could make this work, I think you've got a big problem if you created the democracy in Pakistan. Presumably, you're talking about creating democracies that we don't control. And if that's the case, you're going to create, you're going to mobilize uh, a billion Muslims whose own interests are highly inimical to our own. So I'd say be careful lest you get what you're wishing for. Mm -hmm. Which is what we seem to be getting. Let, let me uh, shed the heavy mantle of George W. Bush for a minute. Thank you. Um, and, and, and go back to uh, uh, th this general issue of, of if I took, uh, if I understand you and your remarks, um, the movement to uh, go from Afghanistan and the war on terror to the invasion and occupation of Iraq, you see as part of a general trend in American history to conventionalize irregular warfare. Um, you know, as all of us sitting here know that um, over the past weeks and months, there's been continual and rising controversy about why, in fact, the United States went into Iraq. In fact, it's a fascinating uh, process that I guess parallels to some degree Vietnam as well. This notion of fighting the war first and figuring out why it's being fought second, which I guess could also be identified as a historical trend sure. uh, in the United States. Why do you think 
uh, I mean, that analysis about going from irregular to conventional warfare um, almost smacks of, of uh, mysterious forces. I mean, actually, people make decisions yeah. uh, or try to at the top levels of government. Sure. Why do you think, in the wake of Woodward's book, in the wake of uh, uh, Dick Clark's book, many other attempts to come to an answer to this question, why did the United States, why did, was the Bush administration so determined from a very early point to occupy, to invade and occupy Iraq. Yeah. Well, I, I hope I've advanced an argument you haven't heard somewhere else in, in answer to this point. I'm not suggesting that these are evildoers or the president wanted revenge for the assassination plot against his father, uh, or even that uh, Wolfowitz wrote this report for the Project for a New American Century 10 years ago, and it's an idea that's been on the shelf. It's time to go. I, I think the problem is revealed uh, in our lack of strategic vision. That when you don't know what to do, you do what you know. We have a military designed to fight nations. And Donald Rumsfeld put it very, very revealingly when he was asked about Iraq. He said, well, Afghanistan just didn't have that many targets. And, you know, Iraq is a, a nation with a big military. With, it's the kind of thing you can clearly plan for. It's very much harder to think about how do we track down these little cells, these little combat units that are sprinkled all over the world, and a lot of them in Waziristan. Even Waziristan, we decided not to go after that, but rather to go after Iraq instead of the various uh, different uh, strongholds uh, that the Taliban and al-Qaeda maintained in Waziristan. And in, in fact, I remember uh, one meeting where uh, somebody said, well, Professor, you're always talking about history. Well, even the British Empire couldn't control Waziristan. And I said, well, they didn't have UAVs and the kind of special forces that, that we have. It, it seemed to me that that was job number one. And uh, I, I guess the reason this bothers me so much is that I do worry about either Al-Qaeda's acquisition of a weapon of mass destruction or that this whole process is going to metastasize to a point where there are so many groups out there that it's beyond our capability. So what I've said is Iraq happened by high-minded people just not strong-minded people. They had an idea. Their habits of mind and their institutional interests said, let's go after a country. And that's what they did. I remember um, the summer, summer of 2002, I had a conversation in New York with Richard Kapuscinski, the great oh, Polish wonderful. writer, yes. um, who, who, who I said, do you think that there will be a war in Iraq? He said, absolutely. And I said, why? And he said, because you're a state, and state likes, states like to fight states. Yes. Simple as that, yes. and it's inevitable that that that, uh, that this will happen. How I want to go back to this notion of the battle of the story. I mean, you suggested uh, to some degree the kind of war you think the war on terror should be. Yes. That is, small groups uh, fighting to some degree independently, tracking down these yes. other small groups. But the military portion is much smaller and much more dis dispersed and decentralized. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. And, well, I'm sorry, do you want to say a little bit more about that? I had a political yeah. question to ask you, but yeah. why don't you be more, a little more specific? Sure. The, the operational point is very simple to describe. Everybody knows what a chessboard looks like, right? Okay, well, we are playing chess. We're trying to checkmate the king, whether it's Saddam Hussein or bin Laden. And in chess, you want to mass your pieces together. You want to take a particular part of the board. And uh, it's all very understandable. Uh, what the terrorists are playing is the oriental game of Go. Okay? Anybody know this game? It's, you don't move pieces inside the squares, you move them at the intersections where things are connected. Yeah, well, I would expect to uh, play Go. Uh, anyway, uh, in the game of Go, where can you play your stone from move to move? Almost anywhere on the whole board, anywhere. And to my mind, that's we're playing chess in Iraq. Okay, we're going to move another piece over to Iraq while our opponents are laying their Go stones all over in Uzbekistan and Spain, in here and there, and they're going to try to lay a stone right in the United States sometime this year. I, I think it makes great good sense for them uh, to do so, because I think the electoral politics of terror uh, have been demonstrated in the Spanish case, and that the people who suggest that a major attack in the United States would simply uh, rally folks around the president is uh, a case of trying to have it both ways. Mm -hmm. That is, they're saying, well, in the State of the Union address, the President said, we're doing well because we haven't had any more attacks here. Ho, ho, ho. Well, if you have another, you can't say, well, now you have to rally around. Mm -hmm. Then you have to answer some hard questions about why you weren't spending 
every bit of your $400 billion of defense spending on figuring out how to deal with this new kind of warfare. Look, folks, here's how it works from a military perspective. We are so good at traditional, conventional warfare that there isn't anybody who want to fight us that way anymore. So instead, they have to move to this distributed, networked sort of approach or they don't stand a chance. In a, in a funny way, we're being victimized by our own successes in the last form of war. And this is also something that's happened in history. People figure out what made the legions so really good as the best infantry in the world for a few centuries. And they decided, well, we're just going to create holy mounted armies. And we're going to figure out ways to overwhelm. And you, and you end up with the Battle of Adrianople in 378 that puts an end to the dominance of infantry for centuries to come. Well, we're seeing the end of the dominance of traditional warfare and the rise of a whole other paradigm for which we Americans are militarily reasonably well prepared by our own traditions. But our own organizational pathologies have kept us from optimizing these capabilities and continue to do so. I want to ask... of actually attacking the United States. And that the effort in Spain was greatly valuable to them because it showed they could turn an election. Sure. That is, in the Middle East, the impression is that they certainly turned that election. Sure. So am I right in thinking that you're implying that the in interest in attacking here before the election would be to demonstrate that they have it in their power to turn the election one way or another. Sure, it, it would have to be irresistible for bin Laden off in his cave to know that he could have this profound effect on the most powerful nation uh, in the world. With a handful, that's really the, the, the story about the world we live in now. A handful of individuals have enormous destructive and disruptive power. So if you want to show your enormous destructive and disruptive power, yeah. Do you, you do that by trying to unseat, by uh, committing an action that would tend to unseat the sitting president? Sure. It's, it's uh, logical. I, I think the strategic choices for Al-Qaeda, if I can digress for a moment, have to do with um, deciding whether to continue to knock away the props. Honduras decided they're leaving. Uh, another country said, if we get attacked, we will leave, which is sort of drawing a bullseye on yourself. <laughs> and uh, so it must be tempting. Remember, the bad guys aren't 10 feet tall. They've got choices, too, and they don't always make the right choices. And uh, so they're going to choose, I think, between knocking away the props or going big in the United States. That takes a great deal of effort and preparation. And uh, all I am allowed to say publicly on this, particularly since I'm being filmed and taped even by this odd mic, uh, is that we have intercepted two attempts to do so. So we, we know, and, and there is a pub public record uh, reporting uh, some of the arrests that, that have been made, although not with um, the sort of urgency I'm suggesting. Uh, and there was good intelligence with, with which to do this. And a story about how you get better intelligence is mostly a story about networking with other countries. Something, uh, here we are in a journalism school. How many people know that one of the biggest attacks during the Iraq campaign that was thwarted was an attempt to blow up the naval headquarters in Bahrain. And you know who told us about that? Who allowed us to preempt it and to catch everybody planning to do it? Hold on to your hat. Syria, right? Not the hero of the moment. The Syrians gave up the attack cell to us. Okay, that's what this war is about. It's about cooperating. We gotta out-cooperate our, our opponents. And on our better days, we do a reasonable uh, job of this. That said, uh, we have this kind of hidden drama unfolding this year where Al-Qaeda is undoubtedly going to try to mount uh, a major attack in this country. And we are redeploying a lot of the special forces in ways designed to make them keep their heads down 
And uh, so that's, my, my money is on, they're going to continue to try to go big. Uh, and they can knock away some of our props, but uh, that's, that's not a knockout blow for them. You know, I, I mentioned this theory to uh, uh, put the climax to that story by staging an attack that would could be construed by most people bringing to down. have unseated, you know, bringing down President Bush. How would you how would you do that? I mean, I would think it would have to be an attack that could be blamed on the administration in some way. In other words, whose effect could be blamed on something the administration did not do or should have anticipated. Yeah, I, uh, I, I don't want to get into operational sorts of questions about what kind of targets uh, that's that's clearly uh, one of those. You know, I work for the military, but it's amazing how much freedom of uh, action I have. And they, every now and then, just say, Professor, don't give away the family jewels. And, and OK, I'm not going to do that. We would hate to all be taken yeah. into custody as well. Yeah, although a, a more pleasant group, I couldn't imagine. <laughs> uh, we have to be careful not to defend just against the last target. That is, don't just watch aircraft. Um, and all I can say is that we're up against an opponent who understands that all the advanced technologies that make us powerful and prosperous also make us vulnerable. And they have learned to ride the rails of this technology to strike at us. And uh, the one thing I say to my students, I, I teach special operations officers from all the services and uh, from allied countries, and I must always remind them, do not underestimate your enemy. These are intelligent opponents who have a concept of operations that's highly innovative. And we have to try to anticipate uh, what they're going to do. And that's what we spend a fair amount of our time uh, trying to do. And, um, and we've been successful in some cases. And as I've said, the enemy's not 10 feet tall. Uh, for example, after 9-1-1, an aircraft crashed coming out of New York. Remember, 737? Queens. Yeah. And uh, what have we been told? Well, the tail sheared off. That never happened before. It'll never happen again. But for some reason, the tail just came off. Ask your, do this thought experiment with me. What if Al Qaeda had put out a statement saying, we brought that plane down? Not too long after 911, even though they had nothing to do with it, they just claim it. The psychological value of making such a claim, what would have been the economic impact? Who would have been flying the next day? Why didn't they do it? Because they're not 10 feet tall. You'd be glad I'm not on their side. As, you know, like, yeah. the, uh, the, the point is, uh, they do a lot of sophisticated things. Don't underestimate your enemy, but realize that they make mistakes too. And uh, you know, again, I don't want to go too far into operational measures, but the fact that they're devoting some of their efforts to trying to knock away the props among our allies has actually given us some opportunities, and we have struck back hard in a number of places uh, because of this. And um, you know, I'm not here to. to uh, be blindly critical of everything we do, and certainly not to blindly praise everything we do. I'm here in the interest of an informed public, because as I say, I, I think the most important step we can take to bringing this conflict uh, to a favorable conclusion by having a public well-versed in the issues and telling its government what it wants. How do we get out of Vietnam but by mass civil movement? Okay. The path out of this war is also about a mobilized civil society. And I think just you know, to, to go back that the enemy is good but not perfect, well, something they did that was really good was the whole idea of a peace feeler toward Europe. You know, mm -hmm. This show is Bin Laden has the initiative here. He says, OK, now I'm, I'm going to go out there and say, I'm going to offer peace to these folks. Instead of rejecting it out of hand, we should have come back and said, Oh, peace? Yeah, we want peace too. Here's what you have to do. You have to make a tape for Al Jazeera that plays and tells all your people to stand down. Uh, you have to, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, you know, things they would never do. We, we have to be as nimble as they in playing these games. Okay? And that's what worries me most. If we simply go, I've lived in the belly of the beast so long, I know exactly what they're going to say and do before they do it. We're going to move 20,000 more troops. General Sanchez, who's a graduate of my school, uh, is, said, I need 20,000 more. And you know what? He's going to need 20 more after that. That's just the way, if you ask a general how much you need, 
His response is, how much you got? It's as simple as that. What should we be doing in Iraq? Do you, do you think that uh, the troops should be generally drawn down? Yes, now? yes, a a absolutely. You gotta remember that over this past year, we have held Kurdistan peacefully with a few hundred special forces there. The Shia were entirely nonviolent yeah. until we shut down Al Hausa, uh, the, the key paper of there. You know, freedom, wait a minute, democracy, freedom of the press, what are we doing? Okay, uh, uh, that, that lit those folks off. And our own rage at what happened at Fallujah, that kindled this new fighting. Now, in credit to ourselves, we are trying to step back from the fighting with temporary truces and such, and we are trying to bring the UN in. So these are baby steps in, in a good direction. Uh, but in practical military terms, uh, what we have to do is stop thinking of factions in Iraq as an insoluble problem and start thinking in terms of a kind of strategic judo that we can do there with a small amount of our own troops. We can use these factions to police themselves and protect against the depredations of each other. And we can do that with very, very small numbers. Uh, that unfortunately is not how we're thinking. What about the political leverage needed to put the country together again, to quote uh, a military, somebody, <laughs> someone said that recently. In other words, um, the well, governance problem uh, has not been solved, and so far as I can tell, Washington has never had any idea uh, of a way to confront the contradiction you brought up at the beginning of your remarks, which is that if this is going to be a democratic repre representative government, it's going to be a Shiite government. Yeah. Uh, that's inevitable. Well, one solution is to let it be a Shiite government and say, you know, here's democracy, this is what it gets, and, and live with it. Uh, another possibility is, again, to do this strategic judo I'm talking about and have a de facto partitioned country. I mean, Iraq has only ever been unitary under authoritarian rule. It's ethnically very diverse, uh, surrounded by enemies, and it's always had a dictator of some sort. Uh, they're not going to allow us, uh, Iraq to go back uh, to that, but what they can do is have this de facto partition. The Iranians have uh, expressed a willingness to work with the Shia within the context of a unitary Iraq. De jure, under law, it remains a unitary country, but in effect you end up with spheres of, of influence. I think this is something you and I have chatted about before. Yeah. That's an alternative model that makes a, a great deal of sense to me. Uh, but the idea that we're somehow going to create a unified state by putting more troops in there is only true in the sense that it will unify the Sunni and the Shia against us. Let me, uh, I'm going to open this to questions yeah, uh, in one second. I have one last question oh, to ask okay. you, which, which has to do with the battle of the story. Uh, you know, the story that we've uh, been told for the last two and a half years is really a very familiar one in American history about freedom, about good and evil, about there being two worlds, us representing the good world. It really goes back to the Truman Doctrine and, and earlier, uh, certainly to the Cold War. Uh, what should the story be? Uh, you know, you've told us what the military side of this should look like. Yeah. What should the political side look yeah. like? Well, I think that the elevator version of our story is that our opponent says we're conducting a clash of civilizations here. That we have fomented one. And our story is that we are fighting for civilization, one that is universal and based on liberal values and that this fight is in part military, um, but it also has a great deal to do with social development in, in many countries. We want to foster democracy where, where we possibly can. Uh, but the one thing that everyone in the world can agree upon is that the kind of terrorism that we saw in the attacks on America and on many other countries since then is unacceptable. We want to create a world that is not at all permissive of that. And we would have the next day 170 nations signed up. We did have 170 nations signed up, and the invasion of Iraq fractured that consensus. Now we must rebuild it. And I think we can only do that by extricating ourselves from Iraq, allowing some kind of UN protectorate or partition to emerge there, and uh, leave that, that sad land to recover as best it can. Okay. All right. Um, questions? Uh, I think there will be. Yes, sir. Uh, if you could identify yourself and... My name is Mark Tom. I'm a second year student here in the uh, journalism school. Um, I'm wondering if somebody like you would have fed the president's ear and would have been able to convince him to not do the Iraq campaign and instead focus all the resources and forces 
on the standard sort of web water that you're talking about. It's a would-have question, but yeah. what could have happened? What would have happened like, you know, if all that might would have gone into this different kind of warfare? Yeah. Uh, the question is really about what kind of options went up to the president. And uh, uh, certainly not anything, I, you know, here's the president and here's Aquila. So that's, you know, I didn't have uh, uh, any sort of direct ability. Uh, more indirectly, uh, one of my close friends is uh, Wayne Downing, our general from the Army, retired, who used to be head of the Special Operations Command and was working closely for the administration. And uh, he the national, national Security Council, wasn't he? Yes. Before the war. Yes, mm -hmm. and he left because of uh, the Iraq war plan. So you can infer from that what you'd like. Uh, basically, uh, this other point of view that I've talked about was uh, expressed and is, and this is for some, uh, I don't know if people think of the military in monolithic ways. There's a lot of dissent in the military. Uh, our first war with uh, Saddam, I was working for General Schwarzkopf, and General Schwarzkopf opposed this invasion of Iraq as, as well. And we now know that the president's own father had his, uh, a, a set of questions about uh, the propriety of this invasion. So I don't think it's for lack of the visions being uh, put out there. Again, uh, I think, how can I put this? I, I think we have a president who's not too encumbered by formal learning. And, <laughs> and so uh, when you have uh, a large uh, bureaucracy that has preferences, that can articulate them, and the people he listens to most of the time have another point of view. It's not surprising. You know, when a commander in chief says, I will, I will do whatever the general asks for, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, where's Lincoln? You know, McClellan was always asking for more. He never had enough troops to, to do what he, what he needed to do against the horribly outnumbered Confederates. Lincoln just kept sacking generals till he found one who was willing to fight. And uh, the problem that I see is uh, the, the greatest problem in leadership is that nobody ever pays the consequence of a mistake. You know, for Lincoln, you lose a battle. Okay, let me get another guy in here. Let's try something else. Uh, this stay the course mentality has, I think, morphed into something that keeps us from considering alternative courses. And I think that's uh, the greatest threat to our prospects in, in the coming year or years of this war. So. Uh, did, did the, the, the problem, just, just to, yeah, to close the loop on this, mm -hmm. the problem isn't the lack of information going to the top, but the lack of openness of mind. Did Downing simply oppose the Iraq war, or did he suggest another way to fight it? Uh, well, that was uh, the other part of this is that um, uh, a number of us, and for all my opposition to this, I did work on war plans. Uh, there were two views. Uh, one, that the Iraq war should be uh, desert storm minus, that is, send in just a, a slightly smaller force than we did the last time. Then there were those of us who said, well, if you are going to go, you shouldn't go, but if you do, the way to do this without destroying Iraqi society and alienating the whole world is to go in like we did in Afghanistan, a kind of Afghanistan plus. And so Afghanistan was like Bud Light, etc. Uh, Afghanistan plus and desert storm minus were the debating points. And uh, General Downing was an articulate advocate of the, the smaller approach. And what happened was a bureaucratic compromise where instead of the 50,000 that uh, we, quote, innovators wanted and the 500,000 that the traditionalists wanted, we went in with 250,000. And we went in with lots of special operations, knocking out the Scud missile box in the west, saving the oil fields, protecting the Haditha Dam, and mobilizing the Kurds. All that was done in a couple of days by a very small number of forces but there were also 200,000 troops marching up uh, Mesopotamia. So there was kind of a, it's kind of a halfway uh, war the way it emerged. And yes, General Downing was on, on the innovator's side in that debate, uh, but his frustrations ran beyond that to the overall conduct of the terror mm -hmm. war. Yes. You're a friend of the second year in political science program. Hi, Brent. Um, I wonder if you could say a little more about what you see as the role of intelligence in supporting this kind of, or being involved in this kind of network-based war and what kind of cultural and operational changes you can see as necessary for that. Yeah, look, intelligence is everything if you're fighting a network, right? And uh, what it means in practical terms is the $40 billion we spend each year on intelligence is mostly wasted because it's spent on satellites. And satellites are very good 
at looking down and counting tanks and planes and guns, and they can tell you that's a tent there in the desert, but they can't tell you who's in there. They can even tell who's really, who's over six foot four. But there are a lot of people in this world over six foot four, by the way. Uh, that's Bin Laden's a very tall man. Uh, the best results we've had, and I can say this because it's in the public record, there is a new kind of intelligence uh, that's emerged over the past 10 years called clandestine technical collection. We have to have bad names for things, <laughs> officialdom. Uh, it's web and net-based intelligence. It's tracking. You don't run a terror network in 60 nations without the web and the net. Okay? You communicate with people. Uh, you send messages to direct people who are controlling pots of money, the Havala system uh, in the Muslim world. Uh, anyway, you, you do command and control, you do logistics, you do operational planning on the web and the net. Uh, now, we spend a thimble full of money on capabilities in this area, but the results have been enormous. The, the public record on this is the admission that uh, we were inside Al-Qaeda's uh, communications as we were watching Khalid Sheikh Mohammed for a period of weeks. And that's, I'm saying only what's in the public record already. Imagine for a moment that you were looking over his shoulder and reading all his emails for a period of weeks. You know, there was a real debate, do we actually pull this guy in? You know, the, in, in, the big intelligence issue boils down to this, in this kind of war. There are three questions when you locate a bad guy. You kill, you capture, or do you watch? And the Pentagon's preference is that order, okay? <laughs> And my job is to reverse the order. Say so it's almost always better to watch. And then, of course, capture and only kill is a very, very last resort. So this would have given us an eye into what Al-Qaeda what Al -Qaeda it, it was does. planning. To, to the extent to which we do this, it does give us uh, an eye. How do you think we, uh, well, there, it was only mentioned elliptically. Um, there was a warning. Remember, there was a specific flight going to a specific city in this country around the first of the, the last year around New Year's. How do we know about that? Okay. It was um, in a public statement, the Director of Central Intelligence said, um, no, this was not information from a human agent, and it was not satellite-based information. But we have other technical means. Not national technical means, but other technical means. So uh, that's where you need to go with intelligence. Now, that's the first part, is what kind of technology, and it's web and net-based. And the game is a very tough and demanding one because the sites that are used, Al-Qaeda uses sites that exist for a few hours at a time. And operatives are trained years before in knowing which icons to click on, which images to click on, on sites. And you double click on those and it takes you somewhere else. And then that's gone a few hours later. So they're popping up and going away. And uh, there's a real cat and mouse. It, it, war becomes a game of hiders and finders. In, the kind of intelligence gathering needed to fight this uh, sort of war. Uh, but there's something beyond the technical side, and that's the side where we actually network with others. And we Americans are wonderful at building walls between what's civil and what's military, what's federal and what's local, what's domestic and what's foreign, right? That's if the 911 commissions tell us nothing else. They tell us that we build wonderful bureaucratic walls, and we can hardly ever scale them. That's why 911 represented an organizational failure, not an intelligence failure. There's a lot of intelligence in the system. We need to learn how to reward institutions, not on the basis in the intelligence field, to reward institutions not on the basis of the information they control, but on the basis of the information they share. And it, it seems to me that's a big cultural shift, uh, particularly when it comes to working with allies. But our greatest successes have come from working with foreign intelligence. So there's an absolute revolution. When you hear talk about we need to split the FBI apart into a criminal division and an intelligence division to deal with terrorists, uh, it's just nonsense. It's creating new hierarchies that are never going to talk to each other. And the fact of the matter is a lot of terrorists make their way through criminal activity. You don't want to hamper the flow of information about criminal and terrorist activity back and forth. Uh, one of the reasons we preempted a major attack in Singapore, this is also, how many people know about this story? Probably no one person in the whole room. 47 Al-Qaeda operatives working in Singapore, accumulating ammonium nitrate and getting ready for a bombing campaign against American interests. There are 20,000 Americans living in Singapore. Okay? A Singaporean cop is following a guy 
who's been a small time hood all his life, but suddenly he's come into big money and it looks like he's buying chemicals. He says, hey, what about this? Well, this happens to coincide with a videotape that's found in Kandahar, which talks about Singapore. The dots get connected. They don't kill and capture, they watch. And the small time hood leads to somebody else, leads to somebody else, leads to somebody else, and you got 47. One operative escaped. The Al-Qaeda connection, Sammy. But he only escaped for a while. Remember? Watch. Okay, so he showed up in another country whose name I'm not allowed to tell you. And the entire cell operating there was also arrested. That's how you fight this war. You don't fight it by sending Abrams tanks to patrol the streets of people that we ostensibly were there to liberate. You don't kill the innocent. You don't kill those we're trying to free. You track down the real enemy. But unfortunately, as I've suggested, our strategy shows that in many respects in this war, we are as daunting an enemy to ourselves as Al-Qaeda is to us. And that's why we have to think in new ways. Um, I have a comment on questions and I hope you can come back. Um, it seems to me you are telling the story of a with small fighting with the power. Yes. And then they are using the network and the, uh, the other is a synchronized approach. Small fighting powerful is not only in a situation of terrorists fighting with the United States. Uh, they, are, they can be a criminal. Absolutely. And, uh, it can be for good causes. Yes. Uh, activists uh, trying to make differences. Uh, so those people who are on the small side, they don't have to be the defectors on the other side, thinking those things all the time. When yes. Fight with powerful. How do you do it most of that? Yes. So there's something we can learn from those type of activities, in a sense, because those are the people thinking of all the time. Another observation, which I put a value in, I'm absolutely think the terrorism must stop. But the, 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 the sheer impact of arcade as the two events I, 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 I watched, one is not uh, September 11, one is Spain. Uh, it shows something about them very hardcore. Like they don't hit, they don't hijack one plane, they hijack four. They don't blow five bombs, they blow nine or ten. Mm -hmm. yeah. They go all the way to the most powerful plane they can hit. Yes. I don't know how you take that one. This goes together to me, in my observation, is they are, what you're just telling, their story of they are fighting some kind of biggest enemy and, and for the biggest cause. Yes. Somehow that lines together, yes. which is horrifying, but it's somehow that's my observation. I want you to comment on that. Finally, it's my yes. question, and I want you to elaborate. Network versus internet. Oh, there's a question too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, network versus centralized approach is the one picture you're telling. Yes. Uh, it, it's a one mental for your user. Yes. Very, very uh, revealing. Uh, I want to put another metaphor here, which you touched. Judo. Yeah. Which is when small or weak fighting with the powerful, you don't have enough force yourself, you try to use the force of your opponent. Yes. Mm -hmm. And when you use the right, when the timing and the place is right, yes. the impact is all your enemies at force. Yes. And my question is this, using the thinking of the judo's, judo uh, 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 metaphor, and then thinking another sentence you just said, technology makers very, very powerful, but also at the same time, vulnerable. Yes. Put these two things together, where you are, can you elaborate a little more about that kind of danger and that kind of situation we're facing? Wow. It's, it's like a full summary of everything I've said in the last three years. That's, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, uh, what, can I, what can I say um, briefly um, about this very broad set of observations you've made? Is I, I think you're, you're right. Uh, the small and the many are what are going to emerge in this world. Lots of these sorts of networks. Not just terrorists. If I may plug for a moment uh, this, this book, uh, the, the second edition of which will be out in English soon, but is out in Chinese already. Uh, and in Spanish, by the way. 
uh, just before Madrid it, it came out. That's a book that talks about the small and the many trying to achieve real democratization in authoritarian states. It turns out, you know, that's probably the best threat to authoritarian rule is a people who are connected uh, with each other. The emergence of a global civil society, I think, is something very hopeful and very helpful for the world. The real challenge for us, I think where all your comments go to, is we're up against nimble networks. We're the biggest hierarchy in the world, okay? And we think in the most classical and traditional ways about our own power. How do we go from where we are to thinking like the judo master? Can we, can we even do it? Is it? Are we bound to fail in our attempt to do that? I don't think so. What I come back to again in American history is the fact that we have always had this alternative turn of mind. Whether it was Rogers, Rangers protecting settlers on the frontier, to Francis Marion, to Mosby, uh, to the special forces in the world wars in Vietnam. We have always done very, very great things in this area. What we have to figure out how to do is to resolve this tension in a favorable way so that the hierarchy doesn't always devour the more networked part of our system. That's what always has happened in the past, and it's always hurt us. And I think, you know, there are some hopeful signs. Uh, I write about something called net war. So what does the Navy do? Something they didn't ever have before. They now have a net war command where people sit around thinking about, okay, how would a network deal with this problem? And they're saying, gee, maybe we don't need aircraft carriers. Maybe we can have small vessels, each with a few long-range missiles on them thinking all kinds of wild thoughts. And so this is emerging. The uh, Task Force 121, which has done so much uh, to hurt Al-Qaeda in the past several months, do you know what their fundamental tool is? Something called Analyst Notebook, which allows them to map the networks that they're identifying through intelligence and captures. And they make inferences about, well, this looks like a particular all-channel design, so that means there should be something here, here, and there. Or they watch the pattern of movements between spider holes to try to get a sense of what a logistical network looks like. We're getting there. And all I can say about, as a final hopeful note <coughs> is that even though all the three and four star generals and admirals basically don't get it, um, most of the mid-career officers do. The ones who are majors and lieutenant colonels and colonels now, 10 years from now, they're going to have three and four stars, the ones that survive. And they all get it. So I, I think there's a demographic solution, at least at the military level, that says we're going to do all right. On those other departments where people stay until they're 65, change is going to actually come more slowly. So in a funny way, even though we force out our best soldiers uh, every year because they, there can only be so many that go to the higher ranks, it's a healthy thing because even my sternest bureaucratic opponent who says he's going to hurt me, I just say, you know what? You're going away in about three years, and I'm going to be here until I'm a very, very old man. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Um, every network has a vulnerability. Yes. You know, depending on the characteristics of the network, the vulnerability will have, you know, it's only going to be set. So, yes. So, um, in an effort to get you to say something else is helpful, so cool. <laughs> tell us, if you would, what you think might be a characteristic vulnerability of the Al Qaeda network. Sure. Uh, it's openness. Okay? <laughs> A network is inherently an open system. Okay, I'm not talking now about a technological, you know, some uh, uh, network um, of wires. I'm talking about the network of people who are connecting together. If you want to get into Al-Qaeda, all you have to be is a confused young man from, oh, that's redundant, a young man from Marin County, right? <laughs> and you can meet Bin Laden. Okay, a very, very open system. If you buy the story, if you're interested and you're committed, you're in somewhere into a network. That's a tremendous vulnerability. And now I can only take the story a little bit further, and I'll refer to something I wrote publicly on this point, that the American public should um, assume that we're aware of these vulnerabilities. And an interesting example of dealing with a network uh, in earlier history was the case of the British versus the Mau Mau in Kenya in the 1950s. The Mau Mau were highly networked, all you had to do was take a, a loyalty oath. They were, uh, just as Al-Qaeda wants to reduce the shadow of our power, the Mau Mau wanted the British out of Kenya. A lot of similarity, but it was just all taking, it was a microcosm. And the British created something called pseudo-gangs, who were Kenyans 
who professed an interest in the cause, but they actually supported the British and wanted an end to Mau Mau terrorism. And these pseudo gangs were small in number, but by the time they were put in the field, the British had spent three years using conventional forces and bombing to try to deal with the 15,000 fighters. And they had not even put a dent in them. The pseudo gangs, which in number were not more than 100 in their first year of operation, they forced uh, the Mau Mau out of business. They took them from 15,000 fighters down to under 1,000 in less than two years. And what it was is you'd, you'd go around with your little pseudo gang. You look like Mau Mau, you talk like Mau Mau, and then you meet up with another unit, and you find out, and then you're introduced to others, uh, and you find out a lot, and then a British force goes in and bombs a camp somewhere. Or you meet a little group and you kill them all, or you capture them. They had operational security concerns all the time, but the system worked remarkably well. And uh, I guess what I'm going to suggest is that you all should infer that this is on our radar screen. And when we do think about the vulnerabilities of networks, we think in terms of things like that. Uh, we also took apart a Muslim terror network called the Abu Nidal organization uh, a decade and a half ago uh, using means not unlike those that, that I discussed and including some interesting psychological operations. And here we are uh, 20 years almost to the day after a national security decision directive was signed by then President Ronald Reagan. And uh, that directive remains at a very high level of classification, but fragments of it have been uh, made available, have appeared in uh, a number of venues, usually in litigation of one sort or another for, for some reason. Uh, it's come out 20 years ago, in the wake of the Beirut bombing, the Libyan disco bombing, uh, in the wake of these events, uh, the Reagan administration decided that terror was going to be an awful problem in the years to come. And this national security directive said, we have to fight these, we have to declare war on these terrorists. It's a different kind of war. It's going to be intelligence and covert operations. And this directive allows people to kill the bad guys, to capture them, to do whatever it takes. But we have to go preemptively after them. And those are the words that have been leaked in the fragments to date. So what is my point here? The 911 Commission needs to go way before that August 6th PDB, Presidential Daily Briefing. We need to look back institutionally and realize that very high levels, people were thinking about this a long time ago. But one of our other limitations is that every new administration, whether it's of the same party or a different party, thinks that the previous one didn't know a goddamn thing. And so they don't pay any attention to what was going on. And this remarkable document, it is to my mind one of the most remarkable documents in all of the history of American national security policy. It laid everything out. Just like the John Lennon song says, imagine. What if we'd actually begun to act systematically on that beginning 20 years ago and sustaining that effort? There's no 911. There's probably no 93 bombing of World Trade. Uh, you want to talk something about, you know, blame. There's a 20-year track record of not taking this problem seriously enough. And by George, I hope our time of not taking things seriously is over with. Okay. Yes. Nice to meet you. The counterterrorism explored as well, and you know, uh, I was thinking that you, you can only kill terrorists, but you cannot eliminate terrorism unless and until you you test the causes. Yes. And one of the reasons Al Qaeda is there is such sort of a score base behind the Muslim world. And what do you think? You know, how to cut that score base? And you know, they're using causes. They're using number fifteen. Yes. And. But like, I mean, integrated into that, and yes. they're using the Palestine side conflict. Absolutely. So, what do you think about that? Because that goes beyond you know, national security policy. That is actually foreign policy. Ab absolutely. And and it seems to me that this engages the issue of what we call this battle of the story. Al Qaeda's got a great story that's very appealing, and we need to undermine that. And I think our strong suit is in saying, look, nobody in the world, including in the Muslim world likes this terrorism. What you're implying, though, is that we also need to reduce the antipathy that others have for us. And it seems to me that there are some extremely simple things we could do. 
right now uh, to reduce that antipathy. The first would be, how in the world can we portray ourselves as the honest broker of peace between Israel and Palestine while we say we are Israel's strongest ally? It's an obvious contradiction to the whole world. And President Bush, this President Bush, came into office with a wonderful instinct. I don't know if any of you remember this. He was two weeks in office when he said, he was asked about the Palestinian issue. And he said, you know what? I want there to be peace between Israel and Palestine. Remember, he's not encumbered by a great deal of formal learning. So it was all very simple. He said, I want there to be peace but they have to want peace more than we want them to have peace. Now, I'll implement anything they arrive at, but we're not going to get involved in this process until they come to an agreement. I thought that was brilliant. It was one of the, the, the wisest things I'd heard in a long time about the Arab-Israeli process. But after 9-1-1, for some reason, it was decided that he needed to re-engage on this issue. And as you point out, it only worsened our situation in the terror war because they were able to say, see, see what they're doing. But, you know, Muslim people. It's, wor it's worth pointing out, I think, in, on the issue of the battle of the story, uh, that the Sharon administration has been brilliant in essentially subsuming their story under the story that George Bush has put out. Oh, that yeah, is, we're just fighting terror. God help us, yeah. right. We well, are fighting terror. The Russians have used it as well for mm -hmm. repression in Chechnya. So it's a, no, it's a chorus that a number of people are playing. Uh, unfortunately, the audience that we're trying to convince is a billion people who are basically sympathetic to our counter-terrorist cause. Uh, and the Zogby poll data from uh, earlier this year shows that three out of four Muslims in over 15 different countries, uh, half Arab and half not, uh, roughly half Arab and half uh, not, show that three out of four love Americans and like American culture. I don't know if that extends to Baywatch, but they like American culture. And the same three out of four disagree vehemently with our policies. We need to realize that this antipathy toward us is not because people hate freedom, as I believe the president said today, the president said today, but because they disagree with specific policies. And here's one where we could have done strategic judo very easily by continuing to stay out of Arab-Israeli disputes. Something else we could do very easily is uh, have the Saudis invite us to take our troops out of Saudi Arabia out of the holy places. Uh, another step would be to internationalize the presence in Iraq and diminish our own. Uh, these are easy things to do that don't in any way undermine our standing as a great power. And uh, I, if your point is that we need to do things to reduce the hatred others have for us in addition to all the smart things we do to go after networks, I agree with you fully. And we have to have as good an information strategy as we have a military strategy in, in the years ahead. Questions. More of a hierarchical organization that we could negotiate with in a more traditional way. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating point. What, what do you make of uh, bin Laden's demarche to the Europeans? Uh, first of all, I think he means it. The man has I basically looked at everything he's ever said or written. And he's meant everything, I think, except the comment that he already has nuclear weapons. He said that a couple of years ago. And I don't think so. I think if he had them, they'd use it. As you say, the big event the small group with the big event. Uh, so I think that's the one time that uh, makes his nose grow a little longer like Pinocchio. But most of the time he means exactly what he says. And, and I think the real answer here is that, uh, and I think this tracks to the previous point, we need to show the world that we're as interested in peace as anybody. And the reply uh, should be that there is no separate peace here but there is an overall peace. And if Al-Qaeda wishes to lay its arms down, uh, we're interested in uh, whatever can bring that about. Remember now, we negotiated about Vietnam as long as we fought there, okay? And we demonized that opponent uh, quite greatly. Uh, the biggest problem here is any politician who says, I'm gonna do peace negotiations is gonna be out of a job, right? And, and so that's, you have to get somebody who is willing, perhaps, you know, after this next election, either uh, if Bush stays, you know, he knows he's not going to be reelected, or if Kerry's elected and decides to just do what he thinks is the right thing. It seems to me that an important part of our strategy that will reduce uh, the antipathy that others have for us is to reach out and say, look, even now, even after all we have suffered, we want peace. But we want it for everybody, not just for a few. And we want it on these terms, a, ren a renunciation of the violent struggle. 
and mutual expressions of respect for our culture as well as for the Muslim culture and these other steps perhaps that I talked about in terms of uh, in encouraging but not trying to impose a peace on Israel and Palestine. But I think it is most curious that we have ourselves in a, what is a very serious war and we have no one willing to talk about war termination. We have a president who says, well, the war will be over when we democratize everybody. Well, uh, there are generations unborn that won't see the end of that war. Uh, so uh, what's, what's the other al alternative here? And I think the alternative is we have to show uh, a willingness to pursue peace. We, we have to frame that not as negotiating with terrorists, but pursuing a global peace. And, and I think that would be a most constructive way to handle this opening that bin Laden has provided us. There's a young lady in the back. Was, I'm sorry, yes, go ahead. No, 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 you go ahead first. Lisa. She's been waiting well, a long Lisa. time. She has indeed. Go on, Lisa. Uh, my condolences. <laughs> it's related to what you just said and some of the other comments about um, our, the U.S. policy towards the democratization of the Middle East, the democratization of the world. And I'm curious um, what you think concerning this policy and if the U.S.'s true interests are more in line with stability and how um, a policy, sh what the policy is and how it needs to change in order to be more realistic, more responsive to what is reality and what it is that we would most like yeah. to have. On the whole issue of democratization, I agree with uh, Jefferson and uh, Adams, whose position was that the United States should not impose a model on the world, but rather provide an example. And, and I think if other people choose democracy, that's uh, wonderful. But the notion that democracies do not fight each other or that they are somehow less war prone uh, than other types of states is simply not historically true. It's, and, and, any, and there's a whole academic specialty that's now emerged uh, in this area. Uh, so I, I find it uh, very unseemly that we would use military force uh, from country to country. If you read Richard Pearl's new book, An, uh, An End to Evil, it's all about the list of countries on the to-do list that we're going to throw, uh, overthrow their governments and, and impose these democracies. And what I find cynical and counterproductive about it is that there are legitimate stability interests. Uh, and why would you create a democracy in a country like Pakistan, which is rapidly anti-American and in possession of nuclear weapons? Uh, that, that just uh, makes no sense to me today or, or tomorrow. And uh, if there is a path to democracy in these countries, uh, they have to work it out for themselves if it is to endure. And, and I think that needs to be our guidepost. And, and for all the, the, the life of me, uh, I can't understand why our only strategy is we're going to change a whole bunch of countries and then hope for the best. Because quite frankly, of the 60 countries that Al-Qaeda works in, about 40 of them are democracies. Okay? What, are you, what are you going to do? What are you going to do to Germany, where they have all kinds of cells? Right? The answer, you're not, the network's not gone once you turn these countries into democracies. In fact, in some ways, the more open societies you create, the easier it is for the networks to hide. But let's not go down that rabbit hole at the moment. Let's just say that uh, we have an interest in providing a model of democracy for others, but in our behavior, not by imposing. And, and I think our uses of force, our resort to force, uh, as we've seen it in the past year, uh, is one that belies the values we profess. Yes, sir. My name is Victor Herbert. I was a student here 40 years ago. Um, you say we should offer peace to uh, Laden, unless one day he said, all right, I accept, I'm a peacenik. But according to your schema, you would immediately just be denounced. You've still got a hundred other cells everywhere. What evidence is that they would follow him? Yeah. Given the evidence, they'll just carry on. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think the idea of negotiating, we've got a couple of political scientists here. I think. The biggest problem in political science uh, right now uh, is the issue of war termination. How would you negotiate an end? Assuming bin Laden is sincere, as I think he was toward the Europeans, and our response was to try to generalize that peace, how would you do it? How would you enforce it? Uh, you would probably, the media would probably have to play a very big role in the negotiations, right? They're not going to sit around in Paris at a table like we in the North Vietnamese did, arguing over the shape of the table for three years. Uh, it would have to be negotiated through 
uh, Al Jazeera, something something like but, that. But, but what possible interest could he have in actually negotiating peace? I mean, oh my goodness, it's it's an enormous interest. Uh, the peace, by the way, you don't just say, okay, now we're at peace. Presumably, things are done mm -hmm. in the name of that peace. And uh, this is this is a very bright man who has had the courtesy to declare war on us. By the way, you know, we haven't declared war. You know, the last country we declared war on. Italy, as an Italian American, I'm offended by that. But uh, that's the last time we declare these wars of choice we have. We don't declare anymore, and I think that's pretty uncivilized. But uh, he actually declared war on us, and he stated his aims: American troops out of the Muslim countries, and stop taking a controlling position in the Arab-Israeli peace process. Uh, that's a pretty straightforward set of war aims that could be uh, discussed. As uh, and, and now, uh, how would you get enforcement? Uh, I think the best you could hope for would be bin Laden being willing to make a tape for Al Jazeera that would be played everywhere that would say, stand down, it's over. Look what the Americans are doing. Uh, but doesn't he have broader goals? Uh, I mean, his ultimate goal is to, uh, first of all, by way of eliminating uh, moderate regimes that the U.S. supports, like mm -hmm. uh, the Mubarak regime in Egypt yeah. or the Saudi, current Saudi uh, royal family, uh, to eventually arrive at uh, reconstruction of the caliphate, right? I mean, yeah, isn't that the sure. long-term goal? Sure, sure. But l look, does everybody get everything they want in, in peace <laughs> negotiations? That's true. Uh, you know, what you, you settle for, and, and I think what he could do then is undertake a long political struggle to change these other countries. And it's, uh, you know, he wouldn't be the first terrorist to uh, move toward more legitimate uh, means. You know, the problem is, Whoever, and this would have to be done at a presidential level. The biggest, I, I don't think the biggest problem is enforcement on the terror side. I think the biggest problem is getting an American politician to actually respond to a peace overture uh, from Al Qaeda. That's uh, political suicide, right? No matter what your party is. But you know what? There's a time for political suicide. You know, I, for, for what it's worth, I, I know Richard Clark a little bit and uh, have interacted with him some over the years. I. I thought he should have fallen on his sword uh, earlier if he really thought policy was that far wrong. Well, then quit over it. Don't write the report that says everything is going fine. And, uh, you know, I can say that because I'm a minuscule enough actor in all of these events that my departure would not be noticed or uh, maybe applauded. Uh, but the, the point is, your director of counterterrorism, if he says, look, things are very wrong, people need to pay attention, stop. Or if, as Bob Woodward says in The Plan of Attack, the new book, that Colin Powell was actually opposed to an Iraq invasion. You're taking one of the most respected characters in America right now. What if he'd said, I'm walking out over this? And he'd said, I don't think this is right. There comes a time when you put your job on the line. And I think both Clark and Powell had those opportunities. And I think the next president, whether it's a second Bush term or a first Kerry term, um, I think that's the most serious choice they face. Do we even consider the possibility of moving toward peace instead of perpetual warfare? And I think the American people should have a voice in encouraging this. Yes, ma'am. My name is Leslie and I'm not a student here at all. Um, it, it, in regard to this, this idea of political suicide and the whole idea of politicians uh, uh, supporting the war, I feel that there's the same, of course, issue of the war. There's always this um, worry that they're appearing disloyal. And I think that that's really been true for Democrats. And I'm wondering if there's a way that you can think of that they can reframe things so that they won't appear disloyal, they won't be committees political yeah. suicide, but they're reframing the issue in a way that the populace could understand them. Yeah. Uh, that's our biggest challenge, right? All I can say is that debate is not disloyalty. That's, I, I obviously, from my remarks, you know, I don't believe in just towing the line. And the president at his own press conference last week said he welcomes debate. Uh, so, well, let's hold him to those words and have uh, a real debate. And, and I think that, uh, you know what, the American people, uh, a lot of foreign policy specialists suggest that democracies have a tough time with foreign policy because their mass publics don't really know what they're doing and they force governments to shift wildly and, and be unable to sustain policies over time. I don't buy that. I much prefer the, uh, the French political philosopher Condorcet who said that there's a great wisdom in the people and they often find the right path when those in high office cannot. 
And uh, so I, I think that this open, this free and fair debate will force all of these issues out there. And I think we should all be insulted by the notion that debate must stop in a time of war. I think this in particular is, is a time when all the issues have to be on the table. And I hope I haven't offended anybody here tonight in expressing other views. Uh, I do it not in any kind of partisan way, but in the sense that we need to consider our alternatives. And in particular, in my bailiwick, military affairs, I see a pattern that has occurred again and again and again in our conflicts, where we do some innovative things and then we fall back to old standbys. And if we can rekindle a sense of the innovative and the unusual in the military realm, why can't we do the same kind of innovation in the political realm? <coughs> Yes, sir. My name is Phil Humphreys. I'm an alum, but more importantly, I live in the neighborhood and I feel privileged to attend these kind of events. <coughs> uh, are we doing, is, is the U.S. and its allies doing all it can to attack financial resources and terrorists? If, if not, what more can we do? Yeah. Uh, we're doing a pretty bad job on the um, attacking finances. I hope I didn't offend a banker or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, we're we're having a real hard time uh, with this, and we can do better, again, if we cultivate this web and net-based capability that I was talking about a little earlier. Uh, here's the basic problem. Uh, the only money we get is from these, quote, Islamic charities that we decide are supporting terrorists, and that accounts for almost all the frozen monies uh, that we've uh, confiscated uh, to date. The problem is that the money moves in a strange way. Does the term Havala mean anything to any? Okay, traditional Muslim money movement system where money exists physically in two pots. One of those might be in Waziristan and the other might be in a candy store in Los Angeles. And the people in Waziristan, in, in a bazaar somewhere, might be getting money from Al Qaeda that they're handing them in return for weapons that they're buying. Okay? So there's a pot of money there. And in the candy store in Los Angeles, uh, an individual who's working in a job in LA. Uh, might give a hundred dollars a week in the candy store and says give this to my brother in Peshawar okay? And so an email goes from the candy store that says to the fellow in Waziristan send a hundred dollars to this fellow in Peshawar Okay, and they take a hundred dollars cash and it, it goes usually through a family member off to Peshawar Now what happens with the pot of money on the American side is that how about those guys who were living in the United States before 911 they go into the candy store and there's been an email from Waziristan that says, give $100 or a certain amount of money to this fellow here, and he's, he's going to say something to you, or there's, there's some way to identify him. Okay, that's how the money moves. Okay, there's legitimate money, there's dirty money. All of our money tracking systems are designed to identify dirty money that's being laundered. Basically, our problem is looking at clean money that they're trying to dirty. And, and so we have a whole mindset problem there. Then we have the problem of the money physically itself is in these separate pots in different places, and the only links are emails. Okay, so that's, and all I can say, sir, is that we spend a great deal of time trying to get inside that, and sometimes uh, we have succeeded, but it is a blip. And it's an area that, uh, again, I'd, you know, forgive me, I'd, I'd like to take every penny away from what's being spent on satellites and start putting it on people who know how to track and how to back hack and how to follow these things. Because that's really, if we're going to begin to get at the money problem, it's going to be through web and net-based collection means. You know, I'd like to ask you a, a political question. Do you have a sense that um, under a Kerry administration, things would be done dramatically differently? And uh, more specifically, the movement that you've identified from innovative forms of warfare and conflict to uh, inevitably back to traditional forms would be reversed somehow? As I've said, I'm, I try to be uh, non-partisan about things. I'm, I'll talk to anybody who will listen if, uh, you know, naturally I think I'm making some sense, so I'll talk to anybody who will listen. And uh, I had the privilege of uh, being a doctoral fellow at Stanford for several years when Condi Rice was a junior faculty member, so know her a little bit, and have a conduit in on that side. Um, I also do talk with some senior people in the Democratic campaign because 
The uh, sort of security studies field is a small one. Your political scientists will know this. It's, we're all wayward social scientists. There aren't too many of us who are in the bombs and bullets business, so we sort of know each other over the years. And, uh, and yeah, I have some contacts there. So I've got a vision of both sides, and uh, I frankly like a lot of the talk I'm, I'm hearing and the receptiveness to uh, new ideas uh, among the Kerry uh, people. So that's, uh, it's a hopeful sign. On the other hand, it's with regard to the things I can't talk about with you openly, uh, there's been a lot of acceptance and a lot of undertaking of, of a great deal of innovative things and our real successes, particularly in thwarting attacks in this country and in places like Singapore and speedboat tax planned off the Strait of Gibraltar and other, other areas. Uh, we have uh, the, the benefit of an MBA type president is that uh, he's willing to uh, try some, particularly things that are going to be entirely covert and even if they go bad nobody will know about. Yeah, let's try that. So uh, there's good news on, on, on both sides, and, uh, and I find that, that heartening. And I would just say for all of us, however the election turns out in this very divided country, we must all still be committed to the fullest and freest and most open and searching debate of these issues and uh, requiring that ideas be vetted and uh, thoroughly, thoroughly assessed. And I think, you know, this 911 commission wouldn't even exist if it weren't for the citizens, the survivors of those killed in 911. Nobody would have had this commission without them. And there is a great deal of ability of the mass public to weigh in uh, on these issues. And we, we have this remarkable divided election year with each side. You know, in, in many respects, we're in a seller's market right now, okay? Each side is going to want to show how responsive and good and innovative they are. So let's use, let's use this, this moment, this window of opportunity to try to turn things in a more productive direction. Well, I have to thank you for coming here and helping us all make a start on doing just that. Uh, please join me in thanking uh, John R. Quillen.